Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 9 for May the 1st, 2016. We begin a new unit today, Unit 3, entitled Fullness of Faith. Our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is Facing Up to Failure. Facing Up to Failure. The devotional reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 23, uh, verse 33, and chapter 24, verse 6. Our background scripture is taken from Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. And that is our print passage today uh, that we will be discussing, Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. Our key verse reads, So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, Rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. That's taken from Luke chapter uh, 17, verse 3. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to review what Jesus said about causing one another to stumble, correcting the offender, accepting the offender's repentance, and forgiving. Also, number two is to appreciate the importance of correcting and receiving correction in a loving and gentle Christian manner. And number three, study and improve their methods and styles of godly correcting of others when necessary. We have three outlines today, I'm sorry, actually four, that we will be talking about uh, from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 17. The first one is entitled, Woe to Anyone Who Causes Another to Commit Sin. Second outline is entitled, Forgive Your Brother. The third outline is entitled, A Request for Increased Faith. And the fourth outline is entitled, A Parable of Extra Service. We certainly thank and praise God for the privilege of being able to share another word from our Sunday School lesson. We hope that you have been following along with us as we have been studying the gospel according to Luke. Um, we want to continue today uh, with some of the teachings uh, of Jesus um, during his ministry. I want to read some of the uh, lesson background from our lesson standard, and then we're going to read the background, uh, the biblical context for this lesson uh, in our quarterly. In Luke 17, Jesus was on his final journey to Jerusalem and the cross that awaited him there. The trip narrative begins in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, and ends with the triumphal entry in chapter 19. Many teaching opportunities are recorded in this section of 10 plus chapters. Sometimes Jesus was teaching in the crowds, uh, sometimes just his 12 disciples. Today's lesson falls in the second category. And from the quarterly, um, we want to share this biblical context. In Luke uh, chapter 17, verses 1 through 10, Jesus seems to imply that unwillingness to forgive is the cause of many losing their souls. Um, in Luke's gospel, the offending person repented and asked for forgiveness and was given. But in other passages of scripture, the person may be forgiven even though he or she might not repent and seek forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, Peter asked Jesus how often we must forgive, and Jesus answered 70 times 7. Then the disciples cried out, Lord, increase our faith. If we have to be that forgiving, we need more faith. Then to help their faith, Jesus spoke of the unlimited power of faith. And then by the parable of the obedient servant showed them that humility is the groundwork of faith. There are a couple of points that I want to make uh, about these uh, 10 verses that we will be discussing from uh, Luke chapter 17. The first thing is that we're, we will be talking about 
uh, Jesus' warning of offenses, that's uh, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 5 um, through 10, uh, we will be talking about faith and our duty. So let's begin uh, Luke chapter 17, uh, verses 1 and 2, and I want to read this from the NIV translation. Again, it's entitled, Woe to anyone who causes another to commit sin. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So this commentary here helps us to understand the importance of of how we conduct ourselves um, with other people, uh, other relationships. It could be someone that has never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or it may be a fellow Christian. But here we discover that Jesus' offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. The word translated offenses is from a Greek derivative, which means bent sapling or a snare. Bent saplings are little trees that can do uh, that can and do often trip people. So often there are multitudes of alluring things designed to catch us unaware. The movie industry is notorious for setting images designed to entrap before the viewing public. Still further, there are legions of personal, social, religious, and political bent saplings and snares tripping humankind 24-7. To be sure, from time to time there will be occasions of stumbling. The children of God must always be aware that it is our responsibility to so walk so that others following our example may not go astray because of our bad example. Jesus warned that it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. One might say, I am grown. I can live my life the way I want to live it. But that is not the spirit of Christ. We should never do or say anything which may cause weaker Christians and non-Christians to stumble. The warning is clear. God will judge us. The consequences of causing others to sin are serious indeed. So we, we know that uh, after reading this that we, are, uh, we should be more mindful um, uh, of the things that we say and do that cause other people um, uh, to stumble and to fall. Uh, what I find interesting about this first outline, uh, particularly uh, when we do these types of things, uh, it's rare, at least in my experience, that uh, those who we, uh, we have offended will tell us. Uh, they will literally uh, and oftentimes just drift away without saying anything to anyone, and sometimes we believe that uh, they left or, or they uh, fail to come back around us, if you will, um, uh, because it was something that they did. Uh, but if we were to catch up with them, uh, it may be a different story. You know, but it, it, it is something that uh, we have to be mindful of because people watch us and they, they listen to what we say. Uh, we say we are Christians and uh, we, are, we are quoting scriptures and things like that. Um, but we have to be careful that we don't cause other people uh, to stumble and fall. Uh, a good book uh, that we could study about this uh, would be the book of Galatians. Uh, this was certainly a church that uh, Paul had established and, and uh, heard about and, and uh, checked on them, and they had wandered away because of uh, the Judaizers who had come in and began to uh, upset their faith. And sometimes that happens, uh, even uh, with us as Christians. There are things that people do and say um, um, that uh, may offend us. 
uh, and, and with the, uh, the church at Galatia, um, they had started wavering um, and turning uh, from the gospel of, of grace uh, to legalism. Uh, so we have to be careful. I, I love this uh, because it's a very practical message uh, as we get through this uh, lesson, a uh, very practical application that is very thought-provoking that we need to be conscious of uh, and that we will suffer uh, tremendously by the hand of God for causing other people. God does not want us to do that. And we need to be careful what we condone and what we give license to. That uh, uh, And sometimes people, those that we offend, uh, sad to say, uh, in many cases, and a lot of this is doctrinal error, um, that we cause others to stumble uh, because of our interpretation of Scripture. And sometimes uh, people never recover. Uh, so we want to be able to keep those things in mind. The question asked here in the quarterly is, have you ever been in the presence of someone for whom you have had great admiration and appreciation, and that person engaged in some activity or said something unbecoming to his or her Christian bearing? How did it make you feel about that person afterwards? Did it cause you to stumble, yes or no? And then it asks for an explanation. So we all have a, a story to tell, and, and we certainly have been guilty of it without even thinking about it. And we simply have to ask God to forgive us of our uh, shortcomings, if you will. Um, the Bible is clear in the first epistle of John. Um, the first chapter, if any man say he does not have a fault, he is a lie, uh, and the truth is not in him. So we all are have, and, uh, have been guilty of this, um, but we want to be careful about our uh, habitual habits. Uh, certainly a non-Christian is going to look at us a little bit more critical uh, that we should never make a mistake, uh, but that's not a good biblical practice or teaching. But uh, we want to be careful of our habitual habits, things that uh, we do regularly uh, that may be ungodly, may be offensive to someone. And just be aware that, uh, uh, that uh, people are watching us uh, to see uh, how we live and how we interpret Scripture. Very powerful points here. Uh, and this could cause us to suffer uh, from the hand of God because we fail to apply this principle in our everyday life. So again, um, I want you to remember that we're talking about these offenses uh, in verses 1 through 4. So the second outline is entitled, Forgive Your Brother. This is taken from Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 uh, from the NIV says, So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, you must forgive him. I, I want us to understand here that these commandments, and that's what they are, are not suggestions uh, to us that we should uh, follow if we feel like it or if it suits our situation. Our Savior, our Lord and Savior, um, our God is telling us to be careful to watch ourselves, to take heed unto our actions. And, and, and we know that uh, uh, when, when I said that, I, I, I thought about uh, uh, some years ago, uh, I was teaching about this and uh, someone in the class made the comment that they couldn't do it, that it was hard. And uh, sometimes it is. Uh, we have been hurt. We've been wounded. We've been mistreated grossly. Uh, and, and, and hopefully a little bit later on we can share some things with you to help you uh, with forgiving other people. Uh, sometimes it's not those that are outside of our circle. Uh, it's those that's within that hurt us very deeply. Maybe a family member, uh, maybe a church member. Uh, but we have to practice this uh, if we're going to teach this. This is a principle of salvation. If we look hard enough, 
uh, that we have to confess our sins unto God and he forgives us. So we, uh, we repeat that process in our relationships with other people. So we have to keep that in mind. But uh, seven times uh, Jesus said uh, he wants us to uh, forgive if he sins against you seven times in a day. Uh, and sometimes that's the case. Uh, we have repeated incidences of people doing things to us who uh, uh, sometimes they show no remorse for the things that they do. But as Christians, uh, I like this in verse 4. It says you must. You must forgive him. And we have to be mindful when we don't forgive, we also uh, lock ourselves up if you will, we incarcerate our spirits. Uh, we, 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 we box ourselves into a situation that doesn't make us feel very good, but we, we stay on guard. Uh, and so we get that release uh, spiritually and practically when we forgive. Um, uh, we feel better. Uh, we think better. Um, and so Jesus wants us to practice this it says here in the quarterly, in his notable work entitled An Essay on Criticism, Alexander Pope said that to err is human, to forgive divine. The usual meaning ascribed to Pope's uh, version is that every human can make a mistake. So we should forgive those who do, just as God is said to show his divine mercy in forgiving sinners. While the English poet expressed this truth with eloquence, Jesus had already issued a divine directive concerning mending broken relationships. In verse 3 is the serious admonition and warning, watch yourselves. In verse 4, he said, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Uh, we should note that when a brother or a sister has injured us, we should not talk about it to another person, perhaps seeking some sympathy from other church members. We should go to the violator and tell the person his or her faults in private. Uh, if he or, he or she says, I am sorry and I did not mean it that way, the Christian thing is to forgive. Suppose the same kind of injury occurs again. Jesus said, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, you must forgive him. The lesson that is taught in continuously forgiving is that we manifest and maintain an attitude or lifestyle of mercy. Moreover, we are to forgive as freely and as frequently as God has forgiven and continues to forgive us. We should note that uh, our society society today is uh, riddled with unforgiveness. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, the killing rate uh, escalates, um, the abuse, uh, the backbiting, the lies, uh, the, the uh, brokenness uh, that exists within the body of Christ and our families. Uh, it's about us. Uh, it's, our, it's about our attitudes and how we handle these situations. And, and, and I don't mean to minimize anything that you may be going through as a result of someone offending you. But we really have to be prayerful and mindful. And I always pray this prayer very simply. I just say, Lord, help me with myself. Uh, because in my humanness, uh, uh, there are things that cut us uh, uh, to the quick. They cut us hard and they hurt us. Um, they cause uh, 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 irreparable damage in a lot of cases. But, but the, the, the big thing to do, the Christian thing to do, uh, the mature thing to do is to let that go. Uh, you don't want to harbor that in your spirit and poison your relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the things that affects us uh, in the body of Christ uh, is unconfessed sin. Uh, when I was saying that, the Spirit of the Lord reminded me about uh, even on the first Sunday when we take communion. Um, and so um, 
Paul is clear. He said, let a man examine himself. And when we do that examination, one of the things that we're checking for is where our relationships are with our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, particularly in, 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 in our response to the gospel message. And, and if we uh, uh, don't do these things, I, I tell you, you will uh, surely hinder your prayer life. You will stumble uh, in your relationship with God if you do not comply in obedience to his will to forgive. And so uh, when we examine ourselves and we see that we have issues with our brothers and sisters, we need to rectify those situations prior to receiving the Lord's Supper. We don't want to overstep. Uh, and Paul goes on to say that if we fail to judge the body rightly, you read it for yourself, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, you will see that sometimes we get weak, we get sick. Paul says that some fall asleep or they die um, because they fail to um, uh, uh, judge the body uh, uh, and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ accurately or biblically or appropriately uh, that we can comply. That's the reason for the self-examination. But here... As we said here, we have to watch ourselves. You police yourself. You look in the mirror. You know where you are. You know what you feel and what you think concerning your brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we need to inventory our day-to-day -day walk. Uh, if we cause someone some harm, then we need to take care of that. Um, it's on you to, uh, uh, to get that situation straightened out, you know, so um, we have to be mindful that these things happen, they are going to happen, and, uh, and we have to make sure that we can function in the body of Christ in peace and in harmony, you know, where there's unity, uh, there's strength. So the question is asked here, have you ever been wronged by a spouse, co-worker, friend, or a relative that caused you deep and abiding hurt? Then you forgave him or her, and the same thing happened again. Did you forgive the person? Was it a difficult thing to do? When you think about it now, does it still anger you? You know, and I, I, I have to uh, say that uh, uh, we all have been there, and we all have been affected uh, in our lives by uh, uh, a wrong that has been uh, committed against us, and it, it, it you know, the devil will keep reminding you of what individuals may have done and, and may not let you forget about it, but we have to move on and grow in grace, and grow in faith, and just pray and ask God to help us in these matters to, uh, to get over them because, as I said earlier, they sometimes can be very difficult. And here the third outline is entitled a, Cre a Request for Increased Faith. Uh, this is taken from Luke chapter 17, uh, verse 5 and 6. Again from the NIV translation, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. So here for this commentary, um, it says, when Jesus taught this lesson to his disciples, they looked at him as if to say, Master, what are you teaching us now? It is a very hard thing to do. The standards you have set and shared with us are extremely difficult to attain. Recognizing their weakness in this matter, they made an acute request, increase our faith. Humanly speaking, it is not easy to forgive, especially to forgive those outside the purview of our family and friends. Now the master had said that if the offender continued to ask for forgiveness, then forgiveness must be given. That was a hard pill for them to swallow. In fact, it is hard for us to swallow. So it goes on to say, Consequently, Jesus replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted 
and plant it in the sea, and it will obey you. To be sure, faith is to believe in the power of God, which leads one to act in accordance with God's revealed will. Now, if God reveals to us that we should pray that some sycamore tree be plucked up and cast into the sea, he will give faith for it. And, but that is not the customary thing. What the Lord is teaching is that if we have real faith, we will be able to triumph in spite of all outward circumstances. And we will be able to forgive our brothers and sisters of their trespasses. So it's very important here, Jesus is saying to his disciples, um, you know, the, you don't necessarily need an increased faith to do what I'm commanding you to do. You just need to have real genuine faith and, and believe on God and ask God to help you. Uh, too many times, one of the reasons why we, uh, we uh, can't accomplish things, uh, particularly in our lives and in these relationships, is that we do them on our own. Uh, Jesus says in the 15th chapter of John, apart from me, ye can do nothing. So we have to be mindful not to operate in our own strength and in our own particular faith is that we work through him um, that is able to help us through these circumstances that we can uh, maintain the type of relationships and fellowship that is pleasing to God and you know, there, there are no super Christians, you know, I should say to you. Uh, we all uh, stumble uh, at times. We all have difficult challenges in our lives, and we just need to be big enough to say that and ask God to help us. If you're struggling, pray and ask the Lord to help you uh, through those circumstances, uh, and God will help you if you believe on him and, and trust in his power and and, and, and ask God to show you how. Uh, many times we want to do a particular thing, but we don't know how. Uh, but if we would ask God how to conduct the thing, how to uh, uh, meet the challenge, uh, he will give us uh, that which we need to sustain us and to, to, to give us victory uh, in our relationships and in our fellowship with one another that we can be stronger uh, we're going to need these principles as we go along. We need one another. Uh, and far too often our relationships and our fellowship is strained because of offenses that we don't know or we neglect to resolve. And it keeps us separated. It keeps us away from one another. And the devil is so glad that we are, are at odds with one another that we don't fellowship. But, uh, uh, but if we would come together in these principles that God is giving us, uh, Jesus is teaching practical application of how to get along in this life and how to maintain uh, in these relationships where offenses have, have come up in our lives. Let us keep these things in mind. The, the comments here uh, in the quarterly here, the Bible teaches that all unrighteousness and sin, that's First John 5, 17, in the sight of God, sin is sin. However, in view of humankind, there are some sins that are not as vicious as others. Can you think of a wrong that has been dealt to you uh, that you would have to say, uh, Lord, you got to help me with this? And so there are times where uh, these things have come up. Um, and I have um, issues uh, personal issues, just like anyone else, but I stand ready. Uh, I try to monitor uh, with the help of the Lord where my heart is and that I'm in a position, even as those who have offended have asked for uh, forgiveness, then we must do that. The very first message that I preached uh, when I started in ministry some years ago was entitled, Staying in Position to Help the Sinner. And we have to do that. We have to maintain a position, uh, a loving position, a faithful position, uh, a trusting position in God that we can help someone uh, uh, who has fallen. Uh, even sometimes when people do things uh, that offend us and hurt us, and uh, we see sometimes they fall on hard times themselves, and it, it's our uh, responsibility as Christians not to kick them when they're down 
but to forgive them. And if we can do that, I, I, I know that God will, will be pleased uh, with that activity and smile on your situation. Let us keep these principles in mind. The last outline is entitled A Parable of Extra Service. And again, as we said, we're talking about now our faith and our duty. So here from Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10, uh, again from the NIV translation, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after a sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Verse 9, would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Some of the commentary for this section Jesus set forth a parable to help his disciples to see true service and at the same time to teach them not to overestimate their value in kingdom work. As usual, Jesus used a very simple illustration about farming, something they would be very familiar with. He spoke of a servant plowing or looking after the sheep and doing other farming-related duties. Then, upon completing his chores, he would come back to the house where um, it was his business to help prepare the meal and to wait upon the owner of the farm, who would then say to him something like this, sit down here while I prepare the meal and shall uh, be glad to wait on you. No, you would not expect that kind of treatment. If one is a servant, one would, expect, would be expected to carry out the responsibilities assigned to him by the boss. The question of whether the owner would thank the servant for doing his job is a no-brainer. Therefore, the Lord warned his disciples not to allow themselves to be carried away with the idea that because of their service to the kingdom, they deserve some special applause and accolades. As Christians, we should never feel that what we do for Christ, who bought us and sought us for service, should ever look for and or demand special recognition for doing what we are called and expected to do. This is so needed today uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, those who do things um, uh, for recognition, uh, Jesus is teaching here the very opposite. We should do these things, the good works. This is why we were saved. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 helps us understand that. Uh, we were saved. Uh, to perform uh, good works. Uh, these are not extra things that we uh, should do or be given extra credit for, if you will, but they are simply uh, ours to do. Uh, we ought to love one another. We ought to serve one another. Uh, this is the rightful order. Uh, keep in mind, uh, uh, man had fallen away from his rightful place and duty uh, in the garden and was put out. Uh, of the garden, and so uh, God, through Jesus Christ, restored that order, uh, and whereby we must, we can be saved through Christ, and then we can get back to doing things that please God. Uh, so we have to keep in mind, and I don't want to minimize anything that we do, but if you're doing things to be recognized, that is the wrong attitude about our Christian service. Um, we don't want to sound the alarm, if you will, that we have performed some good deed. Uh, just be a blessing to someone, and God will uh, uh, see those things that you do uh, in secret. I want you to read Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 6. But we want to be careful today. Uh, Jesus, uh, I love Philippians chapter 2. It, it outlines... Uh, very masterfully how our Savior humbled himself, took taking the form of a bond servant, not even recognized uh, when he came, riding on a donkey, uh, uh, living in other folks' houses, eating their food. 
He didn't have to do that, but he came down uh, because God was not willing that any should perish. And Jesus took the form of a bond servant uh, back over in Philippians chapter 2. And the Bible says he became obedient to death. And that's what we have to do. We have to con uh, simply just obey the Lord uh, because it is ours to do. Uh, we ought to be glad that we can be a, a blessing to someone. Uh, you know that was not the case before we were saved. We were not adding those righteous attributes uh, to society. Uh, but now that we're saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and all of these good things and we know the word of God, uh, Matthew chapter 5 says, Let your light so shine that men might see your good works and glorify God. Uh, we don't want the glory. Uh, we want to encourage one another to continue to do the things that they are doing uh, to be a blessing. But God gets all the glory. And it should be noted, he will not share his glory with another. I certainly have uh, enjoyed being able to share these practical uh, uh, teachings of our Lord and Savior to help us understand how to, uh, to repair uh, relationships, how to deal with offenses. And there are times when we have to rebuke, we have to reprimand, we have to censure uh, our brothers and sisters and let them know biblically and in a loving way that these things should not be uh, amongst us as brothers and sisters. And you have to learn how to move on. Uh, there's so much other, so many other things that we need to be about um, as opposed to uh, just focusing on the offenses that uh, have been done to us. And I encourage you today, and I want to pray with you and for you to help you. Uh, and I want you to pray for me. Uh, as I said earlier, don't think by any means that I don't have my own struggles, but I'm praying for you. And I want you to pray for me that God will help us through our trials and tribulations. Jesus said to us, I believe in the 16th chapter of John, he says, as long as you are in the world, you will have tribulations and trials. And they come up in all shapes, forms, and sizes. They come through family members. They come through co-workers. They come through uh, 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 our leaders. Uh, and we have to begin to pray for one another. Uh, they used to years ago, and we'll go on and we'll have prayer. But I remember growing up in the church, and on the first Sunday uh, before we were to take communion, they would, each one in the congregation would stand, and they would say if I had offended anyone from last first Sunday to this first Sunday, uh, please forgive me. And I, I thought that was a good tradition uh, that we kept and maintained for many years. You don't hear too much about it now, but back then, uh, uh, the saints uh, were conscious of, of the things that they may have done to one another, and they asked publicly uh, for forgiveness. And it took a little bit of time because everyone in the congregation made that statement. And then we would move along and we would take the Lord's Supper in the right spirit. I hope that we can bring that back. Uh, I heard Jesus say these words. He says, often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you now for this lesson. We thank you now for the hearers. I want to thank you that I've been able to share with them. And, and Father, we know that there are struggles in the body of Christ. We have injured one another, uh, uh, hopefully and prayerfully, that we didn't intend to harm one another, but we may have. And Father, we ask that you would give us the strength and give us a mind and an attitude to Go to our brothers and sisters and reconcile because it is pleasing in your sight and you have commanded us even through Jesus that we should uh, forgive one another. And I'm just praying for each and every one who may be struggling to get past an offense and, and may be struggling to get over it and to let it go. Give them the strength, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus to, to be forgiven by you and to forgive others. We thank you for your word today, and we want to be pleasing in your sight, but we certainly need your help that we can do these principles and live these principles among our brothers and sisters and help us to make a contribution of forgiveness 
uh, uh, to the body of Christ, that we can heal this brokenness that exists among us and get over the things that have been done to us because you have forgiven us. The greatest sacrifice that you have ever could have given to us through Jesus Christ, that he bore our sins, not his own, but he took on all of humanity's sinfulness that we might have this right relationship with you. And we pray, oh God, that we would not break it, to break the fellowship uh, with hard-heartedness and pride and other things that cause us to stumble whereby we don't obey your commands. We thank you right now. We know you're going to do it, and we know you're going to help us through it. We need you, and we can't get along without you. And we thank you for this prayer, and we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we hope, trust, and pray that you have been encouraged today and that God will bless you in your relationships. Until such time that the Lord will meet us again, that we will share a word with you, we say God bless you.